everyone and welcome to my review and discussion of Queen of Air and Darkness by Cassandra Clare. The third and final book in the Dark Artifices trilogy. It is finally here. I read it. I have so many thoughts and so many feelings. So yeah, this recently came out and I just had to talk about it because um, it was definitely not a disappointment. I had been waiting for it for so long and it was amazing. Like I can tell you that it's going to be a mostly positive review. I received it. I finished it in like five days because I could not stop reading. Um, but also this book is like massive. It's so big. It's like 900 pages long. So that's also why I'm going to put this down now because I cannot possibly lift this book for the entire video because my arm just wouldn't like last it. So yeah, I'm going to put this down. But in any case, this is going to be a review. It's going to be amazing. I have so many things I want to talk about and yeah let's just get started so first of all for the spoiler free section there's not a lot i can say because of course this is the last book in a series and like the entire series is already a sequel to another series so yeah there's not a lot i can say without spoiling things but i can say that it was definitely a very good book it was a lot more complex than i had anticipated because there are so many characters and so many storylines this book felt like it was sort of three books in one because there's just so much going on and even though it's 900 pages long it's definitely not slow like there's so much happening all the time you're not bored for a minute and yeah that's what i loved about it i do also have some little points of critique nothing very major overall it was still a very good book but i think if i had to rank the entire dark artifice series a Lord of Shadows would be my favorite. Queen of Air and Darkness would be second. And Lady Midnight would be third. That's still not saying something. Because all three books are amazing. And I would say that Queen of Air and Darkness is a very close second. And yeah, it was just such an intense story. And even though it was very long. It's very easy to get through. Because it's so... Uh, eventful all the time so yeah i love this book if you can't tell already but that's really all i can say about it without spoiling so yeah from now on it's going to be all spoilers so if you have not read this book uh you shouldn't watch this video i guess because uh, it's definitely better if you're not spoiled so yeah from now on spoilers for queen of erin darkness for the entire dark artifice series also for the immortal instrument series because of course this is a sequel to the Mortal Instrument series. Basically spoilers for all the Shadowhunter books. So if you're not caught up yet. Um, I wouldn't recommend watching this. But yeah it's always up to you. But in any way spoilers now. So you're warned. So yeah Queen of Air and Darkness starts exactly where Lord of Shadows left off. And that is with the death of Livy Blackthorn. Which was incredibly sad. And yeah the first thing I want to talk about. Is how beautifully this book dealt with that loss. Livy is definitely the biggest death we have ever experienced in a Shadowhunter book because before this there were deaths but it was never like one of the main characters and now it is and you definitely feel it it's not rushed like there's a lot of time about the like funeral and the mourning and how every family member is feeling and you just feel their pain and especially because I just reread Lady Midnight and Lord of Shadows I definitely missed Livy myself like she's such an amazing character and now she's suddenly gone which is just so painful and then of course we have Ty, uh, her twin um, who is very mysteriously not that upset about it and then we later discover that's because he wants to bring her back from the dead and that's basically his storyline throughout the entire book and yeah I'll admit like I know that it wasn't probably a good idea but I was like yes bring her back because I want to see Livy again but I'm also happy that that is definitely permanent um in this book because well not exactly but i'm going to talk about it later but um if that isn't permanent then it doesn't mean anything and like the emotions aren't very real and of course livy does come back as a ghost at the end of the book but i'm going to talk about it later but that's definitely not the same so yeah i just i wanted to see livy again but i'm glad they didn't bring her fully back and then of course we have julian who's very much broken because he's basically like a parent to all these children and yeah, I knew he would like go slightly crazy. I hadn't expected that he would take away his emotions. Uh, Magnus took away his emotions with a spell. But also I wasn't that surprised. I can understand like this storyline. And also like I didn't completely understand why Emma was so upset about it. Like I can understand because without emotions you're not really yourself anymore. But with the whole Parabatai thing and the curse... Um, like it is a danger so I can understand that Julian would do something to keep off that danger for a little while At this point it's the only solution 
that they have. So I can understand why he did it. But I also believe he doesn't really tell Emma that until later that it has to do with the parabatai curse and not just like because he's grieving Livy. And yeah, Julian without emotions is definitely very almost scary. He's so creepy. He's like he has a creepy rootless side to him anyway. But now he becomes like a straight out liar and manipulator. And I did like it because I love it when characters aren't all that likable. So I thought it was a very interesting storyline. Also excuse me if this review is a bit all over the place. Because there's so much going on. It's hard to keep it sort of chronological or like in a um, logical uh, order. I don't know. But yeah, I'm just going to talk about random stuff. I have notes, so bear with me. Oh yeah, also something I want to mention is that it's definitely very helpful to read the uh, tales of the shadow market. Oh no, like the ghosts of the shadow market stories. Because there are a lot of things that are explained in those stories. And they are also explained in this book, but they will come as a surprise and also... Um, they aren't explained that extensively. So for example, we learned that Tessa is pregnant. Jem and Tessa are expecting a child. This is talked about in, the, um, in one of the tales or like one of the stories of the shadow market. But in here it comes as a complete surprise and it isn't much talked about. So it might feel a little bit out of nowhere. But like, I can definitely recommend uh, like reading the stories before you read Queen of Air and Darkness. But like that's something completely else. And then just let me talk about some of the other characters. Let's, ju let's just talk about some of the characters first and then more about some of the events. So we have Drew Blackthorn who's becoming more of a major character in this book. I loved it. I loved Drew so much and I really felt for her because she's definitely very lonely. And also I found it so heartbreaking to learn how much she looked up to Ty and how sad she was that he wasn't really paying attention to her. Like she's, this is my cool big brother. And I was like, oh, that's so sweet. And I loved it. And I also loved how Drew and Kit interacted. Like they have very much a sort of sibling relationship throughout this book. Kit learning Drew how to pick locks was just so amazing. I loved how much fun she had with it. And of course, eventually Ty does get a closer relationship with Drew and uh, we know that Ty, Kit and Drew are going to be the main characters in the next Shadowhunter series like the next um, sequel to this I believe it's called The Wicked Powers so it's definitely a lot of um, building to that so I can see where this story is going to go in the next series but I'm glad that we got to see Drew a little bit more like I felt so much for her I wanted to give her a hug and then we also have Helen and Aileen who come back from Wangle Island. They're finally out of exile and they try to take care of the kids, but they don't really know them all that well. This is the first time we spend uh, more time with them as a couple because they have been absent for so long and I absolutely loved it. Their relationship is so cute. I love how they talk to each other and I love how Eileen was like so defensive of Helen and like it's so cute and I love them so much. And also it's very sad because of course they do not know the kids very well. They've never taken care of them. Them, so they don't know everything and yeah it's just it's so heartbreaking because of course there's also this big loss of Livy but their relationship is so cute and I'm glad that everything got better towards the end but like Eileen is amazing Helen is also amazing but I especially loved Eileen she's just so funny and yeah I just loved her character and how she was very much straight on and she told everything how it was and yeah it was just so fun to read about them even when the circumstances were very sad then also we have the relationship between Christina, Mark and Karen. Out of the three, Christina is definitely my favorite character because she's so sweet, but also not like um, overly sweet, but she's very genuine. And of course they end up in a relationship with all three of them, which I found a very, very good storyline. I can definitely see how everyone like sort of fits together, but the only thing I didn't thought was completely fleshed out is the uh, relationship between Christina and Kieran. I mean, sure, they do spend some time and I can see how they would care about each other, but they say I love you so fast, in my opinion. Like, Christina definitely had a lot more time with Mark, so I can understand that relationship. With Christina and Kieran, it goes a little bit too fast in my opinion but yeah maybe that's also like the very aspect of it that they just feel that strongly about each other very quickly i thought that could have had a little bit more time but i can still understand it and yeah it was just so cute and i love how they all loved each other so much but christina is definitely the best out of all of them and in the end when she kills um 
not the old king of fairy but like the new king of fairy uh, i've forgotten his name odin that's such a badass moment and i love her so much christina is amazing mark and karen are also amazing but christina is like one of my new favorite characters of the entire Shadowhunter Chronicles. And I just enjoyed every scene that she was in. And also Christina's friendship with Emma is amazing. Because you really don't see that many strong female friendships in YA books. This was such a good and healthy friendship. They supported each other. They loved each other. They were there for each other. Loved reading about it. It's one of my favorite friendships of the entire Shadowhunter series. And yeah, they're just wonderful together. And... I want like a friend like Christina because she's amazing. And then of course main characters. We have Emma and Julian. The thing is with Emma and Julian. I love them separately. I think they're both very strong and very well written characters. But I'm not necessarily the biggest fan of them as a couple. Like I don't hate them. I think I like them more than Jace and Clary. I was never a big fan of Jace and Clary as a couple. But also I'm not like invested in their relationship as much as some other people seem to do i do think they have a very strong relationship because they of course grew up together and you can see that they know each other very well but especially within this story i'm just not like it's not the most important thing because of course there's all this stuff going on and just them describing how much they love each other unconditionally gets a bit boring at times and i think that's just a general critique of mine of this book is that there's just too much romance like too many romance scenes like scenes between emma and julian between uh, christina kieran and mark like a little bit too much and i can understand why there has to be some scenes like that but it went a little bit too far in my opinion i didn't necessarily want to read about another scene uh, where they were kissing each other and telling each other how much they loved each other at some point we get it and you don't have to talk about it like again and again and of course julian and emma end up together at the end this that is something i had predicted because of course that's always the case with shadowhunter books the people always end up together and yeah i'm happy for them but especially like the final scene where they talk about how much they love each other i just didn't care for it that much it just wasn't the most important thing of the entire series for me also for characters we have diego and jaime uh Men mendoza rosales i don't know their last name uh like what was their last name but anyway the brothers uh diego and jaime um i do not hate them but i also think they weren't necessarily uh important to the story this is a book with so many characters and so many events and i think if i had to scrap like one of the things it would definitely be the storyline of diego and jaime because if you look at it their storyline is quite simple i believe jaime uh, stole like the artifact and then Diego covered up for him but they also had a sort of fight and then in this book they are reunited and they make up again but it's also like if you look at it their story is very simple and I don't think it was necessary I mean it's still a good storyline but in a book that has so much going on um, I think you sometimes have to cut certain things and Diego and Jaime were just not that necessary in my opinion but I did enjoy the scenes between Diego and Kieran because those were so funny like that was a pairing that I definitely enjoyed but apart from that just not the biggest fan of Diego and Jaime like they're fine I don't hate them but they weren't that necessary and then lastly for characters of course all the characters from the Mortal Instruments a comeback Jace, Clary, Simon, Izzy uh, Alec and Magnus and I loved seeing them again because of course now they're older and you definitely have a history with them and it makes sense that they would be here because when there's something going on like this they would be at the center of the action so yeah fun to see them again also glad that they didn't take too much screen time because this isn't their story I would have loved to see more Simon and Izzy because Simon and Izzy are like my favorite out of those old characters I did very much enjoy the joke with like um Simon's uh what it was called D&D character which was called Lord Montgomery and Isabel was like oh my god <laughs> That was a fun inside joke. I love that. And yeah, I was just happy to see them again and see that they were all doing relatively well according to the circumstances. And of course, Robert Lightwood also died in the previous book, but it's almost sort of forgotten because um, Julian goes to Simon and Isabel and then um, they're like, we're also in mourning. And I was like, why? And then I thought, oh yeah, right. Izzy's father died um, it's sort of like an afterthought even though it's very important for the story in general because of course with the new inquisitor and Horace Dearborn and the cohort also the cohort I love that there wasn't like a single um, bad guy in this book as was the case with the mortal instruments and with 
um, the infernal devices but that the evil was this entire organization and with all these different sort of characters and we have Zara who's just super annoying like nobody loves Zara and then Horace Dearborn which is sort of the same and then we also have Manuel Manuel am I pronouncing that right I don't know but he was like sort of the mastermind behind everything I don't know what his deal was suddenly we spent some uh, point of view chapters with him and like he was um, the one who was thinking of it all and about power and I didn't really understand it I don't know if he's going to be more important in the next series because he does survive and of course the ending with um, Idris and Alicante uh, Alicante being completely cut off um, that is going to have some consequences of course but I didn't know what the deal was with Manuel and yeah, I don't know, maybe it's going to be more important in later books, but in this book it felt a little bit weird. Anyway, that's it for character things. Now let's talk about some of the events and like the plot points. First of all again, Kit and Ty trying to bring Livy back. I love Kit and Ty together so much, like their conversations are so funny, but also so sweet and heartbreaking and I definitely felt... Um, Kit's uh, hesitation to help Ty because he wants to help him but also of course it's very bad to raise the dead but I love their sort of plans and schemes and then they get helped by Shade who turns out to be Ragnar Fell who faked his dead and I don't know where that came from and I didn't really care about it that much because Ragnar Fell like I know him by name but we barely spent any time with him before as a character but anyway they tried to bring Livy back Ty's heartbroken of course but like this is the focus point that he has and I loved how they dealt with that and how at the end when they do try to bring Livy back how it doesn't exactly work and she comes back as a ghost and then the separation between Kit and Ty at the end I hadn't expected that Kit goes with Jem and Tessa and Ty decides to go to these Colomans and he's now haunted or like haunted he has the ghost of Livy with him always but yeah again that's something that will probably be resolved in the next book or like in the next book series so yeah I also like that not everything is like picture perfect at this point but I did feel really sad about it because Kit and Ty I, they're so precious and I love them And also I'm a bit scared because of course Ty has brought Livy back And apparently there's going to be a prize So that's going to be a problem I think in later books But yeah, I will guess we'll have to see about that And then the next plot thing that I thought was amazing Is the thing uh, with the parallel universe of Tool So there's this universe where Emma and Jules go to where Sebastian was not defeated he won and Clary is dead and Jace is still under his control and the endarkened shadow hunters are still a thing that was such a fun storyline and it was definitely a very good way to bring some old characters back without um, completely changing the original story Sebastian was still so fun to read about he's such an amazing villain and it was so also heartbreaking of course to learn about parallel Livy's story and how she ended up alone. I have to confess I thought Livy would go back with the Black Thorns because that would be sort of perfect and she's back again even though she's not completely back but I also can understand that she would stay in her own world and again I appreciate it because that is permanent and that makes it more meaningful. And of course all of these characters that are dead in the real world could be back in this world like Raphael it was so funny like he was so sarcastic and yeah I definitely missed him I didn't realize how much I had missed him until we saw him again and it was just so funny and I also think that Cassandra Clare was a little bit self-aware about how much Julian and Emma were like together and all constantly kissing each other with like the darkened versions of them like they're constantly kissing and they cannot keep away from each other and everyone finds it disgusting and annoying so I can appreciate that joke and then Annabelle Blackthorn of course also Jesus there's so much going on in this book but she gets killed at the end by Julian. It's so satisfying and she definitely deserved it. And yeah, of course she was supposed to be dead already. And yeah, I love that scene as well. And then we have Ash, the son of Sebastian and the Seelie Queen. Which is something that was predicted, I believe, by Christine from Poland and Banana Books. Um, it wasn't a big surprise to me because I always thought it would be very logical. And they didn't do a lot with him in this book yet. But um, of course with the epilogue he's going to be important in the next series again. So again a lot of foreshadowing and building for the next series. But of course they got away from Tool pretty quickly. So yeah I'm also happy that it wasn't like an entire book there. 
but yeah i really love the idea and i thought it was so fun to try out something different like that and it's just amazing to see all those old characters again. I cannot possibly talk about everything in this book. So I'm probably going to miss some stuff. But one thing that I definitely have to address is Julian and Emma turning into giant angels. So the Parabatai curse um, sort of uh, happens. And it turns out that when that happens, you turn into this sort of true Nephilim. You become like a real giant angel. And you're burning away. And then Emma and Julian become these sort of giants and they can defeat everyone they defeat the riders they defeat a horus dareborn and that turns out to be the curse and then yeah i just don't understand what the story was about because apparently in the past sometimes shadow hunters turned into these nephilim and then uh, they barely survived it but with parabatai they could survive it but then when both parabatai transformed it was um, like a disaster so I don't know exactly what's going on it was very quickly explained at the end by Jem so that was a bit weird I don't know what was going on I didn't completely understand it but what I did love was how the Blackthorn family came to Emma and Julian to turn them back what they said was so sweet and so beautiful so that was definitely something I very much enjoyed and very much appreciated even though I didn't understand why they turned into burning angels in the first place and then of course lucky their parabatai rune gets burned away by this whole thing and they can be a couple yay finally um i'm happy for them i guess but it's also again not the most important thing for me and then we have all this stuff going on at the ending with alec becoming the new consul and then uh, the cohort threatening to kill themselves if they don't uh, get idris and alicante and then they get uh, sealed off and there's so much stuff happening at the end again all stuff for the next series i know but i did love that alec was consul because he's going to be amazing and then at the end with the party alec and magnus get married which is a beautiful scene and definitely something a lot of uh, Malik fans have been waiting for. So cute, so sweet. I love that we ended with such a happy note and something so beautiful. And then we have the ending uh, with the epilogue with the CD Queen with alternate Jays and Ash coming back again with promise of... Uh, stuff for the next series which i thought was a fun ending you know some things were resolved but there's still promise for more so i love that and yeah and then again you also have the short story at the end of clary and jace getting engaged which is fine i guess but i'm not that invested in their relationship they're also a bit too cutesy for me talking of jerry and clays there were a lot of fake outs in this book because of course uh, Clary thought she was going to die. But it turned out to be the Clary in the parallel universe. And there's also a fake out with Jace. When he gets slapped away by uh, giant Julian. And then it's like he didn't get up. And then it's uh, a next scene. So it's like oh my god what happened. And then when we see Jace and Clary again. He's totally fine. He's just a bit... Um, yeah a bit hurt but there's nothing much. So I don't appreciate that much. I don't like those sort of fake outs. Like... You're making the reader scared that he's dead or something and then there's absolutely nothing. So yeah, that's not my favorite moment. I mean, there were no major deaths in this book in general. Like um, some deaths of like characters who were um, at the Tales of the Shadow Hunter Academy things. And like, yeah, that's fine, but I don't care about them that much. But fair is fair, we did have major character deaths in the previous book. So, you know, we did have major deaths and overall I'm satisfied with that. So that has been enough talking for me i don't know everything i said this was so random but i had so many thoughts and this book is just so incredibly long it's impossible to cover everything but i think i managed to talk about everything i wanted to talk about so this was it now for this review and discussion whoa that was a long video if you stuck around the entire video uh thank you so much for that um and yeah please let me know down below your thoughts on this book and things that you would like to see in the next series things you enjoyed or things you didn't enjoy i would love to hear about them and we can have all like little discussions in the comments but this was it now for this video and if you like this video please go subscribe or maybe give it a thumbs up because i would really appreciate that and hopefully i will see you again in my next video bye